all I knew about it beforehand was the little teaser that uh, Wayne had been talking about all year that, you know, this is going to be big. And um, it's big. I mean, it's, um, it's best seen as an evolution of other reports from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the most recent one, 96 Institute of Medicine, which has evolved into the National Academy of Medicine. But the big change here, Larry, is that um, they, they kind of summarized all these previous recommendations, which have been pretty consistent through the decades. You know, the only way to have a good healthcare system is primary care based. You know, all the things that uh, we learn at FMEC meetings. Uh, and, uh, but they took it a step further and say, how do we implement this? And make very specific recommendations. Um, and Joe, you'll appreciate this in terms of, basically the, the problem all along is there's been nobody whose responsibility is to improve the health of the people in this country. Uh, the whole public health system has been, you know, eviscerated. Uh, Michael, it's almost as though they read your book and just sort of pretty it up as a consensus report. Well, I'm glad they did that. I, I, I actually uh, am going walking with Chris Kohler on Saturday. So okay. I'll thank him. He's a good friend. He obviously paid attention to the the message. Uh, there weren't there weren't many clinch fists in the presentation, but uh, the, the big focus was on how do we actually get beyond the report and to implementation to the point of um, specific recommendations for changes in the uh, federal government, uh, having a secretary for primary care under the Health and Human Services area, having a uh, a direct continuous funding for uh, primary care at NIH and on and on very specific changes that they recommend and they all sort of integrate into a whole. So I, I would recommend looking at it. You can actually get, I just downloaded the whole 450 pages of it. Uh, there's a lot of repetition of course, but just the summary itself. Uh, and then and then you can go to the different, uh, but. The three things that we've talked about that I haven't had time to digest in this report that I'm excited about, one is measuring what's important. In other words, if we're going to change the whole healthcare system based on primary care to try to improve the health of people um, and attain the quadruple aim, how do we measure whether these innovative changes are actually having that effect? And, and I, I think I saw some of the uh, impact of... Uh, uh, of our buddy Rebecca Etz, uh, who, you know, in terms of measuring what matters, um, there was a lot of the same verbiage that uh, Wayne has um, been teaching us in terms of the definition of high quality primary care. So I was thrilled. I'm still very excited about it. Um, it's a, it's a lot, a large number of people, mainly, um, uh, family docs, pediatricians, uh, a lot of uh, institutions. So it's got a very broad base of support. And uh, it, it was not sort of wishy-washy. It was very direct in terms of why this is important. Uh, all, the, all the reasons that we have so many problems in the country now because this hasn't been done over the years despite all the recommendations to do this. Uh, and very specific changes they recommend that would help implement this, including setting up a, a scorecard to sort of see, you know, every year report to Congress, report to the, uh, the rest of the country. Where are we making progress on this scorecard? Where, are we, where do we still need to uh, uh, put effort? So my real question is, um, Obviously, they spent a lot of money, two years. I think there were 12 or 16 people on this. I'm sure they had lots of meetings. Uh, they have a huge staff <clears throat> and they produced a 450 page book. Um, it'll be very exciting to see how these implementations are actually followed through with. Um, a very exciting $90 book. 
Oh, yeah, but you can download it for free. So there you go. You're only gonna you're only gonna read it on your tablet anyway, right? Um. So, Lynn, did you get a chance to look at it or listen to the report? I did. I was impressed, as you have reported, in how they broke down the steps in achieving change and what has to happen. So there was a nice mixture, I thought, of what to do and a little bit about how to do it. Mm -hmm. High level on how to do it, but at least it set the agenda for, you know, some some of us coming up, all of us coming up with detail underneath how to make it happen, implementation. It, my memory, I think I read the abstract. And one of the things that I was excited about was they referred to the common good created by primary care, yes. which I thought was an important sort of foundational idea. So you can tell Chris, for me, uh, Michael, you and I had breakfast with Chris years ago when, when I was visiting you in uh, in your hometown. And uh, you tell Chris that I thought he did a superb job of making that point in particular. And, and he was very clear. He said, look, a mistake has been made over the years saying, if you get more primary care, you can reduce the cost of care. That's the wrong focus. The wrong, the right focus is improving the common good, which means you get more health. And doing that short term, trying to convince people has undermined a number of initiatives because it takes a long time to get the benefits. What I call the promise of primary care. It takes a long time to, um, to, to really affect that level of change. And initially you're gonna spend more money because Ramp, rank, ramping up primary care costs money. So when you do these two to three to four year projects, uh, it comes out uh, looking like uh, primary care just costs money. And Len, I had a conversation with your buddy, Mark, about value-based care, and he made that very same point. He said, I wanna hear about uh, direct primary care or anything else saving money. I wanna hear about it, how it's increasing the health of the people who are, are getting the service. And of course it's hard short of looking at things, short-term things like A1C, um, it's hard to prove that primary care improves the health of the population unless you have like Barbara Starfield did, uh, you know, a number of years, perhaps even decades uh, to look at that. I, I thought Chris was really superb. And, and when there was a moment, and I forget when it came up, somebody said something that moved it back to saving money. Chris was very adamant and jumped back in and said, you know, basically reminding the group, it's, it's the common good. Uh, he just did a great job with that. I saw a quote this morning, and I wish I could remember where it came from, but it was beautiful because it made the point you're making, Larry, it, it said, Essentially, in all the research that's been done about health systems around the world, the only thing that has shown that when you put more of it into a community, people get healthier is primary care. Right. right. And, and, and also the cost will go down, but it's over, you know, uh, a significant period of time. It's not in the short term. You know, you, you remind me of something that came up so often in managed care and was so infuriating. And it was this whole idea that insurance companies would not cover benefits where the payback wasn't real quick. Yeah, because 18 months. Were, yeah, because they were concerned that patient churn happens so much with payers, they change payers before the benefit of whatever one payer puts into a given patient uh, reveals itself through better health and lower costs down the road, um, by then they'll be on a different plan. So they would do these uh, ROI analyses, which were just infuriating because obviously if the whole industry was on board, people would come into the plan that said they're gonna lose somebody. It's a dynamic equilibrium, right? They go from one plan to another and the other person goes back in the other direction. 
but you would face that all the time when you'd sit down for contract negotiations with payers. Well, um, to your point, uh, Lynn. Hey, hey, Joe, you listening in? I yeah, am. Sure I'm here. Am. Yeah, I'm still at the office. Oh, oh we got a couple of Joes. We got multiple Joes, yeah. Yeah, hey, Joe. well, I've been able to join you, but I'm not going to do video because I'm in the middle of trying to do three things, but I'm glad to be on. Hear you. Did you get Joe, it? Joe, you could tell us the truth. It's very hot in the desert. Put some pants on and turn on your video. <laughs> <laughs> I will listen here. If uh, you doubters, here we go. Uh, here I am in the ah, office. There he is. Working Hello. Away here. So, Hello. Fully dressed. I'm here. <laughs> dressed. Uh, least dressed from the waist up. Exactly. It's only it's only a hundred today. We haven't we haven't seen any heat yet. Oh, okay. So, but back to your point, uh, Lynn, the the like the summary paragraph is that um, primary care is the only healthcare component where an increased supply is associated with better population health and more equitable outcomes. For this reason, primary care is a common good making the strength and quality of the country's primary care services a public concern. Um, and by defining high quality primary care as a public good, they're also stating the need to have accessibility to everyone in the country if the whole country is going to benefit. And they talk about, you know, a parallel with uh, fighting a, uh, COVID, that, you know, it's, it, it, it's not good enough to have a certain group of the population do well with COVID. Everybody in the country has to do well. Everybody in the country has to get vaccinated and has to have access to care. And um, they really think, you know, this sort of shocking study of how COVID showed just how fractured and horrible our current system is for great numbers of people. Um, it gives an opportunity, you know, to sort of show the way to make things better. The dilemma, as they say, is, well, who, who, which players really are accountable or responsible? Nobody. Nobody's accountable for the improving the health of the citizens of this country. Um, nobody's really accountable for figuring out what's best for the citizens of this country. This, this group of experts is probably the closest the country has to, you know, and of course the six people on this call to try to figure out, uh, you know, how can we make this healthcare system better for all the people in the country? And that's why it's, you know, it's, it's all the decisions have been made, Lynn, to your point, by CEOs whose job it is to maximize stock price, period. You know, they happen to be in healthcare, but their real job is to maximize stock price. You know, and and Dow Chemicals probably has poisoned more people in the world than anybody else. But I'm glad they're taking care of their employees at least. Uh, I did bring I did bring that issue up with Kathy. Yes. What was her What was her take on that? <laughs> yes. What was I her take on that? Yeah, she she can only say I didn't manufacture an apom myself. <laughs> That's right. She, she just um, she smiled and acknowledged yes i would i would just like to throw out my one big question and uh, you know all the headlines have been good uh good stuff but where's the beef i i yeah. don't i don't see this as anything different than validating barbara starfield and uh, we've had two prior uh I, they were the iom then we've had two prior you know, powerful primary care reports saying everybody should have a primary care physician and it's the basis of our healthcare system and it's the way it works. And, and uh, is this just rally around the flag uh, that will be, you know, or are there, is there any teeth in this for our healthcare system that actually says, you know, how, you know, we're going to change how we pay for primary care. We're going to change what the ratio of physicians ought to be and needs to be? I mean, is there anything in here that's other than uh, primary care is really important and without it, you don't do well? Joe, um, I had that same feeling. So I, I went and actually downloaded it. And there's a whole chapter at the end called the implementation plan. 
and it it talks about how how our current system evolved, who the players are, what the forces are, what all the resistance to these kind of changes is, and what it would take to actually make a, a significant change. And and um, that's where they come up with specific recommendations to Health and Human Services to have a secretary for primary care, to have uh, full funding for uh, research at NIH to to actually figure out how do you measure uh, your, your chosen outcomes in primary care without drowning the providers and, and uh, you know, too many clicks on their computer. Uh, so they have some very specific recommendations. Now they don't have any authority, um, but they have some pretty specific recommendations about who ought to do what. At the macro level, the federal, state, legislative branch, they have a whole list of changes in policy, funding, uh, laws. And they talk about, you know, which coalitions, which associations could uh, lobby for this. Uh, and then at the micro level, they talk about just how to make things more free for people to do innovative ideas for things like uh, direct primary care or chin health to, you know, have an opportunity to, to try things out, but most importantly to be measured um, and, and to have everybody learn together. It's kind of a idealistic situation where for this to succeed, you have to assume there's a large number of people who really want this result to take place. And uh, as, as we keep coming back to, the people who make all the money are, are not, you know, you don't make any money by making the general health of the population better in the short term, as Larry says. And you certainly don't improve your stock price of your insurance plan necessarily, your insurance company. But um, Michael came up with the idea that uh, everybody should be in a federally qualified health plan. And, and you know, you get the people who run that thing uh, from the community to uh, sort of decide at their meetings, you know, where are we gonna focus? What are we gonna emphasize? You've thought about this certainly more than I have, Michael. Um, how would you summarize what is, I know you want people to march in the street, but besides that, what, what's gonna have to happen for, for these sorts of things to actually take place in the current you know, fee-for-service capitalistic system? Uh, it can't take place in the current fee-for-service capitalistic system, I'm afraid, as far as I see. You know, I, I think honestly, you know, and I'm friends with a number of people who were part of that report and they know what I think, um, it's going to take a movement, not necessarily marching in the streets, um, but I think it's going to take a movement and uh, some way to encourage and empower communities to organize themselves to build what I tend to call small healthcare systems, you know, basically a primary care system that includes everyone. You know, we are progressively marginated because of our, our shrinking market share. Um, you, you know, probably no more than about 43% of American adults have primary care and that number is going down, not up, and got battered in the pandemic. So we, you know, unless we have that mass mobilization, imitating the civil rights movement to the movement for marriage equality, you know, or the anti-war movement, um, you know, and create a kind of sense of national mobilization to get this done, I don't see it vaguely possible, regardless of how good the idea is. And someday, um, maybe Larry and I can do a little uh, podcast about my vain attempt uh, to uh, implement uh, uh, mobile integrated care in the, in the city of Central Falls in Rhode Island, the smallest city in the smallest state, um, how we tried to make it so that the city owned and run EMS could take the 75% of their transports that were for non-emergency things and bring them to the neighborhood health center, which we had just built. Um, and someday I will tell the story about how that was effectively impossible 
and blocked by everyone involved. And when you see that story, you'll begin to understand from kind of the ground up how entrenched we as a nation are inside, you know, what passes for healthcare system, what I call a market. You know, every single person's got their, you know, got their finger in the pocket or their iron in the fire. Everybody wants a piece of their own control and everyone's terrified of losing what they currently have and will fight to the death. And I really mean to the death, like to the level of almost death threats, um, you know, to prevent any change whatsoever. And this was, you know, I mean, I'll never forget in the process of trying to do this, um, the uh, city employees who are EMTs, who are firemen and EMTs, when I took, it, took them through this, um, when I explained what we were trying to do, they said, wait a second, if we start doing that, nobody's going to go to the hospital anymore. Nobody's going to use EMS. Everybody's just going to go and use primary care. And, and, and they turned around and said, and fine, you're a socialist. <laughs> they work for the government. <laughs> and he said, I was a socialist. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but that, you know, in order to get around that, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's an exercise of mobilization and organization. And, and I'd like to comment uh, two things that perhaps I missed. I listened to the whole presentation. I have not downloaded or read the report yet, um, but I, I will uh, do that. But there were two issues I thought that a group like this with the uh, stature that they have, they could have addressed. And the, the one is, how do you bring together the groups like the business community, for example, uh, how do you bring them into that conversation, Michael, that you're trying to have in, in your little, in your area there? Because it's in their financial interest, both in terms of saving money, and number two, in terms of having a healthy workforce, how do you bring them into this uh, uh, this uh, process? And that, that issue was not addressed. I think there are probably some other groups out there that I'm not thinking of right now, who, if there was a way to come together uh, so that all the stakeholders who have an interest in the health of the community and uh, the money that's going uh, outside of the community, getting sucked in into health services that aren't necessary. That's number one. The second issue that I, I was disappointed, and again, maybe they addressed it in the, that last chapter that you, you, Pat, you talked about, Pat. Uh, and that is the question of, um, this is a national group with a big vision. And they're one of the groups that could have taken on our academic institutions. They did talk a bit about the pipeline, uh, but they didn't really go at it, in my opinion, directly uh, in naming names, so to speak. And, and our academic medical centers who are government funded called NIH and uh, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, they are ignoring the public good. What, what Chris Kohler talked about, uh, the common good, they are totally ignoring it um, and, and they could have been um, um, br brought in. Now, maybe their idea is the grand strategy is you get the czar at Health and Human Services who uh, can um, uh, begin to work on this, but I didn't see anything that would give teeth to that and, um, and, and move that forward. So I, I was a little disappointed with that. Well, I, I, what they, I agree with you. I mean, uh, the reality is you try to do anything in government, um, government employees are sort of at the mercy of congressional funding and congressmen are at the mercy of who's going to fund their next re-election campaign. So to Michael's point, whoever is making the most money today is, is going to spend the most money to make sure they make the most money tomorrow. And um, so, you know, I think the reality is people in Congress 
primary job is to get reelected and and to do that their most important thought every day all day long is how do I raise more money yeah and to, to that end I mean the entrenched stakeholders and, and all the middle people in healthcare form the largest single block of employees in the entire nation right mm-hmm. and in most towns and in America in the world. and thus in the world and most towns in America the the hospital, the local hospital is probably one of the three largest employers. Yeah. Um, and but, everybody forgets that all those local hospitals are publicly funded, whether they're private nonprofits or for profits, yep. 70% of their income, um, is, 70% of their receipts are Medicare and Medicaid. Yep. All and, public money. And then they also receive back end subsidies either as a tax free entity or you know, through Big multiple time. incentive programs. But that, to, to Larry's point about how do we engage, so it's, you know, we can't, we can't challenge those who stand to make money to, to Dr. Tokar's point that, you know, they are the largest employer in every community. They have the ear of, of every elected official, but, um, you know, we can speak to the 30 to 40% medical spend on, on the employer purchasing side through conversations with organizations and individuals like Dave Chase and Health Rosetta as they as they start to paint an alternative picture of value in healthcare purchasing to employers. I mean, that's that's how we got the medical home. That's how we got PCMH and and quote unquote value-based primary care. The current iteration of it was the employers finally getting fed up and said, you know, screw all this noise. Right. And and to your point um, about about fighting and having to, you know, going to the brink of death. Like, you know, it's funny, everyone, everyone talks about Paul as a godfather of, of PCMH and they think it means, they genuinely think that that nickname is a reference to, you know, his role in shepherding the movement, et cetera. That's not at all true. He did do all that too, but like he, so he earned that n- nickname internally when he was at IBM and he was in a meeting, I think it was Cigna in Arizona. Um, and the medical director there simply said, no, no, we're not going to, we're not going to change our benefits package. We're not, we're not going to do any of this. Like, why would we, why would we do this? And he turned around and without a proper authority or authorization said, look, you're going to sign up. You are going to hold a demonstration on this medical home project. You're going to announce a pilot, or I am going to pull every IBM life from Cigna nationally. And not only that, I'm going to work with every other major employer to make sure they do the same. And the next week, the Cigna announced second or third medical home pilot in the nation. And Paul's boss sent him an email saying, hey, I know that you're an advocate for this medical home thing, but you need to, you know, if you want to be the godfather, please leave fewer horse heads on beds. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's really genuinely how he earned that nickname was his boss being like, WTF. Right. You know, you are threatening to use the employer purchasing power in the way that every TPA fears. So, I mean, and that's, that's how we got medical home. I mean, quite frankly. So um, if we can get Dave Chase to maybe in a more compassionate way, present a value proposition for, for value-based care and, and relocalizing healthcare, that, that might be the way to go. It's all about kneecaps. <laughs> it's all about kneecaps. If I can pick up on that, Joe. So I just finished, and I will send to you uh, after this call, I just finished an interview with Bryce Heinbaugh, who mm-hmm. is one of the 210 Rosetta-trained brokers who's bought into the Rosetta model, lock, stock, and barrel. He's now making money by helping employers spend less money. And he's done this in Ashtabula, Ohio, the eighth poorest school district in uh, the state of Ohio. And he followed in the footsteps of what happened at Allegheny County. If you read Dave Chase's book, Relocalizing Healthcare, one of the uh, stories, he tells the Rosen story, he tells the Allegheny County story. So I got a hold of Dave and said, can you introduce me to the people who were back when it started? They were the principals who got this thing done. So I've, her name was Janice Klein. She worked for the uh, schools and she brought together along with some others, the uh, school boards and the unions 
and help them to see that they had a common enemy. And that was the insurance companies who were raping uh, their schools. And I, I don't have the description of that written up, but the interview is completed. Uh, if I have my way, it'll be a plenary at our uh, annual meeting this fall. And uh, Bryce Heinbaugh came into that process late and then he took that learning to Ashtabula and he's working with a DPC practitioner, James Lambros, and they are for this school district. Uh, they've got the employees through the unions have bought into this new model. Um, people are, they, they're actually getting paid. The employees are getting paid if they choose um, the high value, low cost uh, services when they need to have their knees and hips and whatever's done. They, they've created a whole benefit structure that the employees now value. And I think what can happen is these employers have working with the unions and working with their employees, I think have the, the power that, um, uh, that Joe was describing. And I think when it gets big enough, they can be part of the lever that flips things. And I get the, uh, the revolution, Michael, but I, I think that employers have the ability to put a serious uh, squeeze working with their employees. That's my personal belief. I agree Larry. with you, Larry. And once again, they're the, they're, they're the most powerful group that actually benefits both short-term and long-term by improving the health of their employees. You know, they, they might go into it because, oh, this, this is gonna save us money. But uh, then as their employees are healthier and uh, particularly if they're starting to get some of their behavioral health issues addressed, um, they're starting to get some of their mental health issues addressed. Uh, it, it, it's great for the bottom line of the company. So that, that answers the question, who, who makes money on high quality primary care? It's probably the CEOs of self-employed, self-insured employers. Guys, I'd, I'd love for it to work. Um, but look at Scott Conard's experience himself yeah. um, and anticipate, you know, what happens when this process gets big enough to bother Cigna and CVS. Um, what happens is they come along and buy some piece of the process um, and put that piece of the process out of business um, because you know, they know how to play to win. Yeah. So, and so Dr. Fine, um, it's one of those interesting things where, and, and Larry speaks to this really eloquently. There are now family physicians who are coming into the right spots at major companies to make a real difference in a way that hasn't been the case before, right? So I had a call with a guy named Kenneth Finau, who is, who is a family doc, and I think I'm the medical director over at Cigna. And he, he literally random called, randomly called me at, at six o'clock at night asking about, hey, what is this direct primary care thing? Like Cigna wants to figure out advanced primary care and value-based primary care. Like what can we learn from, from DPC? Um, and you know, he, he made that call because he's a, he's a family doc and he's plugged into what family docs talk about. And he also has the value kind of strangely enough, the, the revolutionary zeal of other family physicians. And he just happens to be in a decision-making role. Um, and so maybe there's, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing it by any means, but maybe there's hope because you have this generation of, of family medicine leaders who have left practice and entered these leadership roles at major companies um, and have enough cachet internally to say, this is in our best, it is in Cigna's best interest to play ball here with this, with this advanced primary care thing, right? So this, this greater good, this common good, if we invest in it, then we, we stand to gain. We just need to figure out how to reach all of those individuals. And, you know, it, 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 I guess, as I speak out loud and think out loud, it kind of pisses me off that the AFP doesn't have a roster of every single family physician who is yep. a, a senior executive at one of the health plans like they should. But, um, I mean, we, you, you all know these people. You all probably trained a bunch of these people. So, Joe, I, I, again, I keep having hope. 
Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, look at just look at what just happened with COVID. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, just look at what happened with vaccination alone. Yeah. Um, CVS and uh, other big pharmaceutical companies walked in and said, we're going to vaccinate, you know, all these people. Um, and the primary care community got left out of the vaccination process. Now, uh, that may seem like we got a big hassle taken off our shoulders. Um, yeah. But, you know, I once did a study in my own practice of what percent of our yearly income came from doing flu vaccine because we did a bunch of flu vaccination and it was like 10% of our yearly income. Um, and it gave us opportunity and an excuse to be in contact with our patients uh, so that we had some one more, one more piece of continuity. That just got pulled by a direct deal out from under the primary care community because you know, CVS had the connections they needed to make a, a deal directly with HHS. And I think what you're going to see, I fear what you're going to see, is that, you know, they will copy enough of the direct primary care process um, to make it so that uh, people trying to go into pri to practice by themselves uh, won't be able to use the employer base. They will still be relegated uh, to using, to working only with people who are uh, self-insured um, or, uh, you know, are, are marginated in some way because that's just the way the business process works. That's not being critical of the business process, but I think our challenge and our opportunity is to understand that process and, you know, try to stay one step ahead of it, doing, you know, sort of like thinking about threats um, and figure, you know, and, and, and the challenge of something like the National Academies process is to get ahead of those threats. It just mm -hmm. isn't going to happen inside government itself. You know, the, the, it's great to have a, uh, it would be great to have a secretary for primary care. Um, but, you know, until recently, nobody knew who the assistant secretary of health even was. Um, and the reason that person got known was not because of their medical skills. Um, but I've known a couple of assistant secretaries for health. And what I found out along the way is they got no leverage. They got no juice. They got a cool title. It's like being the Surgeon General. You get a cool title. You get a budget of a million bucks a year. And then it's air. Mm -hmm. You got mm -hmm. nothing. And, and that's... You know, it's a it's a very sophisticated power analysis that we're going to need to do and understand how to check what the CVSs and the others of the world are going to do um, if we're going to make this thing run. Yeah, and for better or for worse, you know, CVS is headquartered in Rhode Island, so they and I have had some interesting, interesting uh, connections over the years. Yeah. So at least I know them, and I know a little bit about how they think. And I know some of their senior leadership um, doesn't help me any, but, you know, I mean, every time I fight with them, I lose because I'm way, uh, you know, way underpowered for dealing. Yeah. It, or, or it's kind of like kind of position. I'm sorry. Isn't there a family physician in a leadership role at CVS? I thought. No, I don't think so. I think he's a no. general inter internist. Oh, well, I, I think reduced Larry, what you may be thinking of is there was a family physician who had a network of primary care clinics that CVS then has taken over to, you know, put out a thousand of them around the country uh, as their CVS minute clinic, you know, next stage. The Village MDs? Yeah, that yeah Village MDs, yeah. And that's Walgreens. Okay. Oh, Walgreens, okay. Well, anyway, whether it's Walgreens or Walmart or... Costco uh, or Amazon, um, primary care is, is, you know, just the next thing to be marketed by the big boys. And, uh, and it's not real primary care. That's the heartbreak. Yeah. It's the, it's the worst aspects of primary care where they, they intentionally right. fragment it into right. marketable components and then sell them in, in silos to, but I mean, there, I, there, maybe 
maybe there's hope. I mean, I mean, so there is like, hope. The, like, no, there's there always is, hope. There's always hope. There's so always like, hope. And, the, and for all you negative Nellies who have been talking for the last 15 <laughs> minutes, I have two stories to give you hope. Good. I, I love Joe. I love your story about the Godfather. And here's one that matches what you said. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, it was, I got a call to go to Montana, Western Montana, where a primary care medical group in a town that had pretty, pretty, much, much. pretty much two big employers, the primary care group was getting beaten up for never fixing what was wrong with healthcare by those big employers and beaten up because they didn't get the patients well who worked for the companies who were those big employers. So I show up and I sit down and we're in the boardroom of one of those big employers. And the leaders of the primary care group start talking about how the system is totally misaligned and not getting done what needs to get done by motivating them to keep people well. It, the payment model motivates them to put people in the hospital, rescue, 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 right? Well, the CEO of this company, which was the largest employer in that part of Montana, was a self-made billionaire. And he, he starts to tell the story of how when he started out, he had nothing. He mortgaged his, you know, three mortgages on his house and raised and scraped together money to start doing uh, iron ore mining in the mountains that surrounded the town in that part of Montana. And it was a successful business venture. And when he looked at it, he said, you know, I'm bringing the iron ore out of the mountain. I should really buy some railroads to transport it to where the iron ore is needed buys the railroads, successful venture. Then the EPA comes knocking and says, you gotta clean up the mess you left in the mountains. So he cleans up the mess and the EPA comes back and says, you did a really good job. Can you contract with us to clean up all these messes we have around the country? And he does that and starts a company to do that. Huge success. And then he says, you know, why am I just having railroads? And he buys some shipping lines for international shipping of the iron ore and other things, huge success. And all these pictures are on the, on the wall around the room in the boardroom. And finally he starts pounding on the, on the table screaming, these doctors are not doing what I need. And I pay them a fortune and my premiums go up double digits every year. My employees are sicker and sicker and sicker. What the heck is wrong? What's wrong with these doctors? And I said to him, look at the pictures on the wall. If you made less money by doing a great job in everything you did, would you do a great job in what you did? He says, I don't understand. I said, you're paying these doctors to do a terrible job. You're paying these doctors to not keep these people healthy. You're paying them to, res to rescue them and put them in the hospital and do all kinds of high cost procedures and surgeries. And he got the idea. And then he said, well, what do I do to fix it? And I said, you control all of this. He said, no, I don't. My, my health insurance company tells me that's gotta be this way. And I said, what do you mean? Aren't you self-insured? And he said, yeah, I am. But then the whole thing breaks down when we go through brokers and the third party administrator that we use says it's gotta be this set of benefits and they're not, they're not gonna change it. I said, you are paying those bills, those premiums out of your revenue stream. You can change it tomorrow. So he, he literally tries, I believe it was United Healthcare who was his TPA. And they said to him, we're not changing anything. We can't, we, we're making a fortune on this, forget it. You know, Michael's, Michael's smiling, so he knows the story. And, and he comes back and he says to me, they won't budge. I said, I'm gonna bring you several, I, I think I said 10 other TPAs who will listen and want your business. So he goes back and he tells United he's gonna pull all the business for his 10,000 employees unless they, they change everything and, and align the benefits and the payment model 
and all of it towards primary care and prevention and wellness. Next day, United calls back and says, mm -hmm. all right, let's sit down and talk. Changes the entire model, literally gets United to say that they approve of, I said to him, what do all your employees like to do here more than anything? He said, oh, everybody loves mountain biking. They just love it. I said, well, why don't you give them a mountain bike as a reward for living healthy and doing all the things you're trying to get them to do in prevention and wellness and, and social determinants and, and all that. And he said, we're not allowed to do that. It's a healthcare plan. You can't give them a mountain bike. Sure enough, United said, we'll give them a mountain bike if they meet this set of criteria. And on and on and on and on. It changed everything. So another story about the employer sector and how it works. They have all the control. You are right. We're all right. The second story is the other end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Medicaid, uncovered patients. So I hear about this guy in Florida, family physician who's at a, an FQHC, and this FQHC is getting phenomenal results in Northern Florida in a population of uninsured, illegally in the country, patients on Medicaid, and they're getting great results with chronic disease management, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, heart failure, COPD. So I get asked by, I think it might've been the account, the uh, Academy. Uh, I think I was um, involved with the Commission on Healthcare Services at the time. And go, I go down to meet them and I said, please let's, let's meet with all the people on your care team for patients with diabetes. They were big on interdisciplinary care teams. Now, usually when you do that, you sit down is maybe gonna be, I don't know, 10 people in the room because you're gonna have the doc, you're gonna have the support team, you're gonna have the pharmacist. If they're really innovative, you're gonna have the social services people, uh, all kinds of things. Workers. Yeah, I figured I'd see 10 people. I go in the room, we sit down, 25 people showed up. And this was their care team. And I said, how, what? We went around the room, what is, what's everybody doing? And each person would tell about their role. The person who was their IT person would tell stories about getting emails timestamped at 3 a.m. from the head nurse for the diabetes team who would have an idea or see something pop up on her screen uh, about a given patient and risk stratification and, and calling the IT person at 3 a.m. and saying, you gotta fix this. We gotta get this message out to everybody on the team. Routinely, that was going on there. And finally, I said, how do you guys afford all of this? Where are you getting the resources to pay for this? This amazing primary care enhanced uh, team-based patient-centered approach, addressing social determinants. And the guy who, the family doc, who was the um, chief medical officer said to me, he had the idea that he knew that when the system's broken, and patients don't get what they need and they're rescue, rescue, rescue. They go to ERs instead of to their primary care because there's no good access. They end up in a hospital and stuck in beds because they don't have housing, stable housing, or they don't have food security and all kinds of things. He said he had the idea to go to the four hospitals in this city, medium-sized city, four big hospitals that were the, the recipients of the patients who showed up in the ERs. And he had a discussion with each of those CEOs of those hospitals. And the discussion was, how much money are you losing on every one of those patients showing up in your ER with your fixed overhead costs and what you're getting paid in a, in a Medicaid setting of a diminished payment or in a no coverage setting, you get nothing. And, and they all knew exactly what they were losing based on their accounting. And he said to each one of them, let's do a deal. Let's come up with a formula where you know where you're at right now. And for every patient visit to the ER that I prevent by giving augmented primary care services based on an agreed formula you and I agree on, I will get from you half of the money I saved you that you would have lost. They agreed, all four of them. 
And they went and they, they did this. The last time I went back and checked, which was about four years into the program, he received quarterly checks from each of the four hospitals. And the total of those 16 checks a year, the last time I checked to him, which was half of the total they saved, was $8 million. And he took the money and he turned it right around into all these services that we can normally never afford. So it works. <laughs> you know, the, Definitely works. It works even in a yeah. non-employer setting if you can get at the kind of foundation of where the leverage is and not just say, you know, FIFA service is terrible, it's broken, we all know that. Uh, but volume brings more revenue, but it also works when you look at the bigger picture of beyond the silo budget and in where it's broken the most, which is in care for the underserved, that you can take the money that you're going to save if you can do a better job and leverage that from the institutions that will support how do we save, how do we lose less money by getting good primary care to these folks. And Lynn, isn't that similar to the formula that Chen Medicine is, is doing with uh, high-risk meta Medicare patients? That's what I was right. actually gonna gonna point out as well. That we do have this surge in in high-value Medicare Advantage-oriented plans, and and that is a niche ecosystem. But that it is it's a niche ecosystem that represents a ton of money. Um, right. And so you know they people. yeah once and once they are once they are entrenched in Medicare Advantage, like, you know, um, I've talked to a number of the guys at, at ChenMed as, as Larry has. In fact, I met um, doc, Dr. McCarter through Larry, like yep. they're poised to do the same thing to manage Medicaid plans. So right, once they have the infrastructure, they have the systems, they have the, the robust processes, they can make money and manage Medicaid hand over fist and, and serve other patients too. But I mean, another story, Joe, you are right on target. I talked to a couple, married couple that started a DPC practice and their big, hairy, audacious goal, BHAG, BHAG, their goal ultimately is to use the DPC model and manage Medicaid that states would contract with DPC networks in that payment model to dramatically improve the resources that are going towards primary care and in a structure that promotes delivery of value. That's pretty cool. They Larry, to, you know them. They need to talk to Erica Bliss. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the wins and the losses that she experienced, right? Yeah, so exactly. Len, and, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. No, 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 by all means. Len, who, who is that couple? Imagine MD. Rhea Campbell, she sent you an email uh, just the other day. Well, I responded to her just today, so I look forward to talking with her. Yeah, that's their BHAG. Right now, they're doing it with employers and trying to build size so they can ultimately go to a state-managed Medicaid program and say, try this. Let's do a demonstration project. It's not been tried that I know of. Does anybody know if it's been tried with managed Medicaid? Well, in North Carolina, not exactly the same way, but, you know, that's what Alan Dobson did 20 years ago. And it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it worked well. Yep. That's a, that's Michael, you, that's a great example because ultimately the politicians stripped that program. You know, it ended up banging. It got so good. It ended up uh, getting hit on the head because the politicians and the vested interests, I think at the root of all of this. QED. No offense. Yes, I think at the root of all of this is campaign financing law. That's what we got to fix. That's really at the root of all of this, ultimately. I used to have great discussions with Rich Roberts about that. When he was more upstream from that is gerrymandering, which... Yeah. Uh, yes. I was, I, was, I was about to say, we, we had the, the hard mathematical reality of first past the post elections you know, winner take all elections. So until we, you know, if you really want to go upstream, Dr. Frommer, I mean, you know, I say that, but the state of Maine just just implemented um, ranked choice voting on the state level. So maybe, I mean. Who knows? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I had the Wait. wonderful experience of having my U.S. Senator sit down next to me on a four-hour airplane flight one time. 
She walked in the door of the plane on the phone, trying to raise money. Yep. Sits down next to me, continues. Everybody in the cabin could hear her. And, <laughs> and when they closed the door and the flight attendant came over and said, you got to get off the phone. She hangs up the phone, her cell phone, turns to me immediately and says, I hate it. And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? She knew I knew who she was. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I can't stand it that I have to raise money from the first day after the election for my entire life. It's horrible. I said, and that started the discussion where I said, well, why don't you fix it? And for four hours, we talked about campaign finance reform and term limits and, you know, all kinds of things. It was, it was a terrific conversation, but of course, you don't get anywhere when you, when you have uh, Citizens United uh, from the Supreme Court, and then you have a Congress that's not going to do anything to, you know, change what the Citizens United verdict was. You know, that's, to me, it's the root of everything. Well, I am mindful of the time. Any last points from anyone? I, I would just like Lynn to uh, increase our hope by saying what uh, Chen Medicine is going to do in the next two years in terms of opening new centers around the country. Yeah, they're still, Larry knows about this because of their, their attempt to recruit and, you know, strong presence in FMEC recruiting. They still are saying 500 centers by five years. 500 by five years. And they, they repeat it continuously. I do have one postscript, Larry, the story about Western Montana, yep. that guy who's a personal net worth is over a billion that the, the ran that company. He's now one of our big investors in our uh, fund. So Great. very nice cycle of life. <clears throat> yes. right. And so. I'm, going, I'm going to ask you to introduce me to him. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Not, no, not, not for his money. I want that story. That story, yeah. That okay, story is I powerful. But I think, I think FMEC could use his money, too, if you're going to recruit a new CEO. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to finish things. Now, I have talked with Dave Chase, and I believe I have finally got him locked in for the meeting in June. Um, I will, when we get off the call here, I will send you a copy of the uh, story about the Ashtabula uh, project that I mentioned to you. Um, and I hope within the next two weeks to have the Allegheny County story written up. And like I say, I'm hoping that they will be a plenary presentation at our meeting this fall. That's not a done deal yet, but I'm hoping for that. We need to get these stories uh, out there. So um, those will be coming to an inbox near you shortly. And I'm sorry for being a bit of a Debbie Downer, um, but I do have hope, considerable hope. And and I know that there is a group, and I've mentioned this before, coming out of the momentum process in Boston, uh, Joe Gabe is deeply involved with that um, to try to build that movement. It's not, you know, it's not like nothing. They're really putting a lot of time and energy into it. And they're an amazing, amazing group of people. So Michael, why don't we get that group and our group uh, connected somehow? They, you guys, I, you guys- I'll have... ask them again. The last yeah. time I asked, they, they, they didn't think they were quite ready yet, but I think they're getting more ready. So let me ask Gabe again. So you guys have this experience and perspective and you can save them a whole bunch of mistakes and time. They'll make their own mistakes, but they don't have to make the ones that we made and, and you know waste decades uh, getting things done. I, I think there's the potential for um, you know, coming together. Always, always good to talk. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you Larry. All. Take, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. -bye. Bye.